So <clears throat> now here's the cool thing about being able to look into your mind and understand that you can look into your mind. Because the basics of separation dictate that you have to have two different entities to be able to look from one thing to another. Because just as a tooth cannot bite itself, an eye cannot see itself, an olfactory nerve can't smell itself, a mind cannot watch itself. And this is the cool thing about you that you're learning right at this moment, is that the, at the instance that you can look in to your mind and see what's going on, you can look into your emotional process and see what's going on, you realize that you aren't that emotional process, that you aren't that mind. This is the point that you go from, I am my mind, to I am a being that has a mind. This is the moment that you go from, I am my emotional responses, to I am a being that has emotional responses. And if you didn't go, oh my fucking God, at that moment, please check your pulse, because this is one of the great instances of epiphany that everyone in the world comes to at some point or they don't if they do their life gets better if they don't their life sucks or they're out of control for the rest of their life and let's hope they get lucky on the external conditions making them happy all the time because otherwise they're never going to understand that they aren't part of the soup they aren't part of the process of their mind that creates their mind's reactions the people who are stuck in that space are a victim of what their mind gives them for their entire lives, and their mind dictates how good their life is 100%. You don't have to exist in that space. No one has to exist in that space. Your mind is a process of the physiology that you have. And the proof that we are not completely our mind rests in the fact that we can look at our mind. We have an awareness that can look back into our mind. And just like a fingertip can't touch itself, right? a mind can't see itself. There has to be a separation between the observer and the observed. And so at the point that you can understand your mind and see your mind and understand its processes and see it working, you realize that you are not your mind from a conscious point of view, right? So you can kind of believe it a little bit. You can kind of buy into it a little bit, right? <clears throat> so your mind and its activity is actually what I call your me, right? Your mind is your expectation or preference. Compared to your perception equals your equation of emotion, emotional responses. You have your self map over there. You have your perception that goes into that. Um, this is your mind's me. This is your mind telling you the thing that it thinks you need to do to survive into tomorrow, giving your emotional reactions to you to help drive you into action. But you are the conscious awareness that exists beyond that. And at the point you realize that, that gives you a lot of freedom to be separated from your mind's reactions and your mind's emotional responses that don't necessarily have to ruin your day anymore because you are not the thing that's causing the turbulence. You are not part of the turbulence. You are not part of the, the existence that your mind is creating at that moment. You are the thing beyond. Now, there's not a whole lot going on in the beyond that your awareness is always filled with your, what your mind's doing, so you do wind up thinking that you are your mind, but at the point that you can separate that, the point that you can understand that you're not your mind, that's the point of taking a huge step towards liberation and you deciding how your life works, regardless of what your mind is giving you. That's huge. That is the hugest thing you will ever learn in your entire life. It's the, the greatest lesson you can ever give yourself is to find that place where you're not quite your mind. You can actually look into your mind, see your mind, etc. Okay? Now, the rule for this tool, because I'm about to give you the tool. I just ran into these slides accidentally. I didn't realize we were at that point in this conversation. Here is the cool tool that I promised you at the beginning of this episode. Um, the tool is called The Me. And the tool works like this. The rule for the me. Anytime you use the word me, put the word the in front of it. And so instead of saying, that makes me angry, say, that makes the me angry. Don't tell me what to do becomes, don't tell the me what to do. 
he she broke up with me he she broke up with the me now saying it this way beyond being grammatically incorrect which is one of its magical awesomenesses um because it just doesn't sound right and brings your attention to it uh it creates a separation between your mind's reaction and the awareness within yourself that is watching your mind or is experiencing your mind's reaction and reminds you that you aren't the mind's reaction itself and you can feel it when you actually say the me so when your mind has a reaction and you say the me is is whatever is angry or the me is sad or the me is whatever it is that your mind is giving you the reaction it reminds you that you are not your mind and you aren't the bs that your mind is creating at that point and so that gives you a little bit of a thick black curtain a thick black curtain that comes down between you and the reaction of your mind to where you remind yourself i am not that that is what the mind's giving me at the moment but i don't necessarily have to be consumed by it i don't necessarily have to react to it and an extension of this is anytime you use the word i because sometimes we use the word i when we should be using the word me so anytime you use the word i use the words the me you know i'm upset about that the me is upset about that i don't like my boss the me doesn't like my boss i wish this or that or whatever it was was different the me wishes that were different okay it is the reminder not in just a a mind trick way but in an actual realization way of oh yeah i'm able to see my mind i'm able i'm able to see the variables in my mind that came together to create my turbulence to create my pain and suffering in this moment so by default i cannot be my mind if i can look at my mind fingertip can't touch itself tooth can't bite itself eyeball can't look at itself needs a mirror needs some kind of distance the fact that I can look at my mind it means there's some kind of distance between the awareness of me and the me itself doing its thing, which is my mind, which is the process of the flesh, the meat suit that's trying to protect me. I don't necessarily have to buy into what it's giving me because it could be mistaken. It could be m- misprocessing something. You know, it's, it's simply trying to protect the laundry list of things that it sees on its mind's self map and a perception that may or may not be correct uh, associated with that thing and this is the output it's, that it's giving me but it's the me it's not really what who and what i am within my existence or in this awareness it is a separate process that's not quite who and what i am it is a part of my consciousness certainly but it's not me it's the me and that one little reminder right there can bring that thick black curtain down in between an emotional response that you're having that could be destructive and give you a little bit of space to breathe. Give you a little bit of space to remind yourself, I'm not this that's happening. I'm the thing that's beyond that a little bit. And I don't necessarily have to buy into that 100%. And it gives you back control of your mind. And if you can look at the variables that then created the emotional reaction in the first place, that fires the right ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, the immediate prefrontal cortex to shut down your limbic system. And then all of a sudden, the negative stuff that's coming up from your me gets turned off. Physiologically. Seen it on fMRI. Right? So this little tool, at any point, that somebody cuts you off in traffic, well, that really pissed the me off. <laughs> right? All of a sudden, you, you're step backing from it. You're stepping back from it a little bit. You're giving yourself a little bit of distance between you and the reaction, and all of a sudden it's not controlling you as much anymore. All of a sudden you have control over what's going on within you better than you did a half second ago when you objectify the thing that is creating your pain and suffering. And you say, oh, that's not, that's not really me. That's the me. Right? And that's a huge, huge difference. And it makes a huge difference in people's lives when you actually use it and take control of your mind in that way because you don't have to be controlled of your controlled by your mind. You can actually take control of your mind. Now, the cool thing about let me just jump to this slide right here. The cool thing about a meta awareness practice is that when using a tool like the me, and you see that you are not the process of your mind but that you have a process of your mind but that you're not it but that you can 
use it. It's a tool. You can deal with it. Or you can shut it down when it gives you problem results. Um, that helps your subconscious that's in charge of writing your mind's self map, like all the things, the process in your mind that creates, oh, this person's a part of my world now, or this idea is a part of my world now, it must be defended, or this new thing that I just got is a part of my world now, it must be defended, right? There's a portion of your subconscious that's in charge of keeping your self list up to date, because it's very important that your self be completely accurate regarding um, your laundry list of items that must be protected, because if you miscalculate on one of those things, it could cost you your life. If you don't have a strict definition of who and what you are in your mind's eye, then the threats that come from the outside world could kill you if you don't have that definition be accurate. Well, there's a level of subconscious that's in charge of keeping that list accurate. But when you show it, when you show that level of subconscious that you are no longer just the mind and that you can see the mind, all of a sudden, that level of your subconscious in your mind has to rewrite yourself, has to rewrite your mind's self map. It says, wait a second, I thought I was the emotional BS. I thought I was my mind's reactions. I thought I was because I was, you know, this thing is flooding my consciousness all the time, this mind thing. I thought I was the mind, but now I'm the mind and the awareness that can look back in on the mind. Well, now I have to rewrite the definition of self to include that awareness. And all of a sudden, your mind's self grows a little bit. You get bigger. Now, there's some really cool things that occur because yourself gets a little bigger in this moment. And one of those things is that your life's problems don't get any bigger, but yourself gets bigger. And so if you have a if you have a self map of let's say a small mud puddle or whatever, and you have some boats in it, which are the things on your self map, and they're floating in there, and you throw a life size problem rock in there, it's gonna splash some water out, it's gonna make you feel a little smaller than you were a moment ago. It's gonna rock your boats, maybe even sink one with the big waves of the big rock. But all of a sudden, if your mind realizes that you're not just your mind, but your mind and the awareness, all of a sudden your mud puddle now goes out to a, what, a small pond or something. So now you, th you throw the same life size rock into the small pond well it might make some waves or whatever the boats might rock a little bit which is the stuff on your self map the portions of your life like you know maybe a, a major event rocks your marriage a little bit or rocks your relationship with somebody a little bit or something like that well now the boats aren't sinking and the more and more you expand that self out all of a sudden your self of mud puddle because becomes a self of a pond, becomes a self of a lake, becomes a self of an ocean, becomes a self of infinity, and all of a sudden that life-size problem rock doesn't even register anymore. It doesn't even hold sway on you. Because you can do this awareness thing out a number of layers, where you can be aware of your mind, but then you can be aware of the awareness of your mind. And that makes the subconsciousness of your mind expand yourself out even a little bit farther. And this is what happens with meditative experiences. This is what happens with the world's contemplative disciplines of being able to expand mind, expand consciousness. This is what happens with psychedelics, where your mind becomes conscious of being more than what it was. That expansion makes yourself larger than what you thought you were previously, and thus your life's problems are less impactful because of that increased sense of that larger, that expanded sense of self that you're not adding individual items to, but just the whole area becomes larger. And the individual points on that map, by the way, then become less significant because they are less of a portion of your sense of self as it expands outward. So a whole bunch of cool things are happening for you in that moment. And you can do this a multiple to multiple levels again, like I said. Your meta-awareness practice can increase to be an awareness of the awareness of the awareness. You can take this out six or seven levels, and at the point that your mind starts to become completely silent, your sense of self expands outward to the point where your mind is so far away that its noise doesn't even register anymore. That's the point that your mind can start doing different things, that your brain can start doing different things, because it's compartmentalized a whole big section of what used to be your entire life. Now is this big. And now that noise doesn't matter as much anymore. And now your brain is starting to do different things 
based on how you're using it. And now we're talking about physiology stepping back in and the plasticity of your brain doing different things and helping you to change and do different things over time. Just like you um, get better at basketball with practice, you get better with p playing piano with practice, right? Your brain changes based on how and what you're doing with your, your mind to help you attain those things. Well, if you're increasing heightened levels of consciousness and heightened levels of happiness and decreased levels of pain and suffering, your brain changes to help you do that on a more effortless basis. And you become that existence. You become that no pain and suffering person. You become that heightened uh, happiness all the time person. You become that consciously aware person all the time because your brain changes to help you get there. Now, this little tool of the me helps you do it that we gave you just a few minutes ago. It says, when you have an emotional response, um, you can do uh, a couple of things to turn that down and to realize that you're not that emotional response and put some distance between you and that emotional response and reduce the pain and suffering that exists because of that emotional response. That's a tool that you can use immediately. Um, and now the cool thing about what you can do with your mind after you take care of all of the um, uh, the regular instances of uh, pain and suffering that exists, right? Your mind does this this thing for a while, for a long time, for all your life, and then all of a sudden you learn something new, and you learn that you're bigger than what you thought you were, and all of a sudden your brain patterns start to change, and your old patterns of existence cease. Well, some new patterns can start to arise and your brain can start to do new things and you can start to gain access to levels of subconscious that you didn't know you had access to before. And by the way, that's where all of our super genius is held is in the subconscious levels of our mind. We're actually the stupid one up, up on top that can handle the least amount of information. The deeper we go down into our subconscious, the more information we can handle and process, the smarter we are. Um, a study that proved that was a really cool study on um, giving people a problem about, <clears throat> it was a judgment problem on how to organize cars or something like that into classifications. And then um, they let you think about that through the whole time. They watch your brain and then they, yeah, they asked you for an answer at the end. And then they gave this second group the same problem, but distracted them and said, okay, we want, we're going to give you this problem. And oh, by the way, here's what we want you to do a number ordering sequence. And we want to put these numbers in order. And so you had to focus on that the whole time, because by the time you were done with it, you gave that answer. And then they go, okay, well, what's the answer to the other problem, the other problem that we gave you up front? The answers that the people gave that were distracted the whole time were better than the answers that the people who were focusing on it the whole time gave because the subconscious process was better at solving the problem than the conscious process was. And it gave more intelligent answers based on the subconscious processing going on. And they could watch in the brain to make sure both areas of the brain were, were firing. So when you were doing the numbers sequencing problem your brain was definitely firing there you were definitely doing that work at a conscious level but your unconscious brain was also working on the original problem they gave you so it was definitely working the same area that they saw up here with this person who was in the conscious awareness and that's where their brain was working the same area was working down here as well but the answers were better when the subconscious itself wasn't interrupted by your dumb you at the top level okay now, when you're able to stop your regular conscious processing patterns and change them, this is the whole ball game, kids. This is the whole ball game to getting deeper into understanding a lot more about the universe and a lot more about your true self and the true nature of your existence. Because there is a point where you get down to the point of two cells. Two cells can get together and build a whole nother human body, including the most complex brain in the universe, the, whole, the whole, most complex tool in the universe, your human brain, from two cells. Okay? Imagine the intelligence level that exists and the wisdom that exists there. By the way, these cells have never touched death, by the way. These cells have existed with life force since the moment that life began, whenever it began. There's been a continued stream of life consciousness. But these two cells down here that's going to come together to create a whole human body, they have never tasted death. And genetic memory has been proven, so our memories could go back multiple generations, potentially to the beginning of time. Who knows? And there's consciousness there. There's a high level of intelligence there. 
the deeper you go back into your mind and into your subconscious, the smarter you get. And the more um, functions that you can unlock that you didn't know that you had access to previously. And that's what changing your, your patterns are all about in mind hacking happiness. You get in there, you shut off a lot of the bullshit that you don't necessarily need, the unconscious processing that is working on a Humanity 2.0 level, not a Humanity 3.0 level, and you start to gain access to some amazing things.